We're continuing to look through the Ten Commandments together. So you'll find the Ten Commandments. They are in there in Exodus the 13th, the 20th chapter. Sorry, Exodus 20. The children of Israel had paused on Mount Sinai to receive from the Lord the, his instructions. Moses has gone up to the mountain and he's receiving instructions from the Lord. We're taking some time with each one of these. Uh, the top ten, we call it. The Ten Commandments were good for them at that time. They're good for us in our time. They're good for all time because they are universal truths, universally applied. Every single person in the world needs to live by God's truth. So when some of the things in the Old Testament get fully explained into the New, everything in the Ten Commandments is repeated into the New Testament. Everything finds its home into in the New Testament. So we continue to to instruct and live by them and to, and to make our lives fit into the Ten Commandments. We're way down on the list now. We're up at the number nine. Number nine, which says, do not give false testimony to your neighbor. Do not live against your neighbor. Do not give false testimony. So that's our, our ninth one here. And, you know, as we grow up, when we are born, we have this nature inside of us to become lawyers. Okay? It's only by the grace of God that many of us did not end up that way. But we're born legalists. We're born looking for the very, the very letter of the law, the exact wording that is given to us. Okay? For instance, if you tell a little, a little kid, when you leave them in the kitchen alone, make sure you don't eat one cookie. Don't eat a cookie. Nothing. A cookie is, is one, so I should eat four, just to make sure I'm not eating one. I'll eat all of the, the, the cookies, uh, but I didn't eat one, I ate them all. Okay, so they will find a way around what you say so that they can do what they want, right? We're all basically legalists when we come to that. When we read something in the Bible, we're trying to figure out the least restrictive way that I can do what it says and still do what I want, right? We're always trying to figure out a way around it, looking for loopholes. We read the Bible looking for loopholes all the time. And we take a commandment like this, and we want, to, we want to just whittle some things off of it. Well, it doesn't apply here, so I'm going to, I'm going to slide that part off. It doesn't apply over here, so I'm, going to, I'm just going to carve this part off. I'm going to carve this part off. And pretty soon we end up with a commandment that's small enough that it'll fit into a little box. And then we can take that little box and we can check it off. Okay, I did that. Check it off. So we've seen every one of these commandments so far where once we dig into them, we realize this does not fit into a little box that I can check off. This is actually very big and it's a lot harder than I thought it was at first when I first started looking. And so we find the same thing's going to happen over here. So let's look at a couple of excuses that have been coming along so far with, with this commandment. The ways that people have tried to whittle off sections of this commandment so that it's easier to do. Well, look at the first one. Look at it carefully. Do not give false testimony. Oh, okay. So this has to do with this has to do with court. So if you get called into court, you've got to make sure you're telling the truth at court because you swear to it and it's, it's testimony that we're talking about. We're not talking about just regular uh, everyday life. We're only talking about court. And they say that this commandment, you can still keep this commandment by whatever you, wait, whatever you want to say, as long as when you go to court, you tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth, right? And so that's a good way to, to, to do this. But you think in those days, 
Once you get further into this book, and they start talking about all the different crimes, you know what the penalty for most every crime was? Almost every one of these crimes that goes on is a capital crime. Almost everything had to do with, uh, with a life and death situation. And if you gave false testimony to the judge, they, they, of course they didn't have the, the whole legal system that we do, they just had the, the clan leader, which eventually could appeal all the way up to Moses. But if you gave false testimony, that was tantamount to murder, didn't it? Your testimony could put some, send someone else to death. So they, yes, they took this very seriously for sure. But let me tell you, this is not just about court, is it? This is not just about when we go to court, even though it says the word testimony. Because you think about it this way. When are you outside of God's courtroom? Never. Okay? There is no way that you are going to escape the courtroom of God. You are always in God's court. Court is always in session. God is always going to see every single thing, and He's going to know everything before you ask. You, know, you watch the, the, the law, the legal shows, and the, the advice that comes in with all the legal TV shows is that the, the, the prosecutor and the defender, they should never ask, the lawyer should never ask a question unless they already know the answer. Well, you know where they get that from? <laughs> they get that from God. When God asks questions, He already knows the answer. Right? One that we were thinking about just recently is they were walking along Jesus with his disciples and they hear some murmuring in the back. They're actually griping and talking about who's the best disciple. I'm the best disciple. No, 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 me. I'm the best disciple. I get to walk on this side of Jesus. You know, whatever they were arguing about. Jesus, when they get there, he, he asks them, what were you arguing about on the way while we were walking? Jesus knew what they were arguing about. Right? He knew exactly what they were arguing about. Whenever God asks a question, God already knows the answer. And so, nothing escapes the courtroom of God. Well, there's another, another excuse coming up. Do not give false testimony against your neighbor. Okay, so, it only applies to neighbors. Right? And so, Whenever the word neighbor comes up, then we, we have to think, maybe they just mean other Israelites. I'm an other Israelite. It just applies to Moses' community. And so it doesn't have any bearing upon the way they treat the rest of the world. It's only us. It's an internal matter, right? Just, just the Israelites. Well, when Moses said, everybody, before we leave in Egypt, Make sure you go and get some stuff. That if you ask them for jewelry, ask them for their money, they'll give it to you as we're heading out of the country. Make sure you ask your neighbors for all their jewelry and stuff and money and gold and stuff. He makes sure, he says neighbor. He calls the Egyptians neighbors. Right? Neighbors everybody. So you can't whittle off this section and say, well, this only applies to just my neighbors. Because you've got to also remember about that lawyer that came up to Jesus. And he said, can you identify exactly who is my neighbor? Because I really want to keep this commandment, but you know, I don't want to do any extra. <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to have to work too hard at it. I don't want it to be nice to everybody. Love your neighbor. I don't really want to do that to everyone in the world. I just want to do what I have to and no more. Right? And then so Jesus has to tell him this story. Of course, that's the story of the, of the Good Samaritan. And the, the moral of that is, who's your neighbor? Everybody. Yep, you're going to have to love everybody. You're going to have to tell the truth to everybody. You're going to have to make sure you don't bear any false witness ever to anybody. 
All right, so principle. The principal principle here is make sure that you do not lie. God doesn't lie, right? God cannot lie. That's what it says in Titus. Titus 1 2 says, God cannot lie. Absolutely can't. Because it's totally against his nature. He will not violate his own nature ever. And so that impacts us. No wiggle room, no way out. There's no loopholes. This is the principal teaching of this scripture right here. And we're going to break it down with some, with some thesaurus work here. That means other words that, that we try to, to escape with lying. Well, it's not a lie. It's just a little slander. Well, we, we can't slander. Uh, gossiping is false witness. Yeah, we can't do that either. Okay? We can't even spread gossip when we're trying to share a prayer request. <laughs> so that's a, there, there's a lot of that that has happened through the years. We try to share a prayer request and it ends up just talking about other people. Well, we don't want to do that either. So gossiping is, is off the table. You can't even imply something. Insinuation. You know, well, I didn't say it, but uh, they could tell that's what I meant. If people can tell that's what you meant, that's a lie. That's a false testimony. Okay, we can't we can't get away with that either. Bible tells us, do not get involved in controversies. Don't spread into that. Don't participate in that. The rest of the world is going to fight and argue. And, and uh, if you don't believe me, just check on to, to British Parliament sometime. You can watch those. See if, if the pay per view. On, your, on the wrestling channel is gone out, you can just sh shift over to C-SPAN and watch British Parliament and they'll have just as many fights, okay? So you, you can see them coming out of their boxes with their wigs on and, and hitting at it. Um, controversies are always gonna be going on and God tells his people, you can stay out of that business because you're not gonna be spreading false testimony here. When somebody is hypercritical, that's also a false testimony. When you're just demanding too much, when you're pushing too hard and, and uh, something might be good and you say it's not quite good enough, that's hypercritical and that is also false testimony. We've got to get rid of that. Hypercritical. Flattery. You go. Flattery is false testimony. So if you don't mean it, don't say it. Okay? There's other ways... There's other ways to say exactly what you mean and be truthful. The Bible says we're supposed to speak the truth in love. Absolutely. But we need to avoid that. And of course, little white lies. The little white lies. We've got to avoid it. So, well, it's not a real lie. It's just a white lie. White lie is still a lie. Okay? And, it's, and you say, well, I don't want to hurt somebody's feelings. Well, you, you've got to think a little bit harder then. Because you can't tell a lie to try to avoid hurting somebody's feelings. I'll tell you why. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. Once they realize they have been lied to, then you have made matters worse. Okay? So a white lie is just kicking that can down the road. Because one day they're going to find out. Yeah, you know, you didn't believe that at all. You didn't mean that. And uh, so it's just going to make matters worse in the long run. Okay? Let's think about some, some special cases. Because when we read this, do not give false testimony. And then we read the rest of the Bible, there's some, there's some uh, issues that come up. We've got to think about these. So let's think about some of the great liars in the Bible. Abraham. Abraham was a liar. In the story, uh, he got scared that when they go down to Egypt, that they were going to kill him. The Egyptians would kill him because they wanted to marry his wife. Now, I'm not sure how this happened. I'm not sure how you can imagine this sort of thing going on. 
But God has preserved Abraham and his wife in such a way that at 75 years old, she was still such a looker that they were going to kill Abraham to, to take her into the harem. So God has preserved her in, in such a way that Abraham was still scared for his life that she was going to be taken by the king into the harem. And so he said, tell everybody that you're my sister. All right? So what we would say is that Abraham told a half-truth, right? He was a half-truth because Sarah was his half-sister. <laughs> so not a full-blown sister. She was a half-sister, so it's not really a lie, is it? But uh, did God accept that? Of course not. God said, uh, came down to, the, to Pharaoh and said, you better get rid of this girl. You better not put her in your harem because she's actually his wife, and that's my man. Abraham's my guy. And you're not going to take his wife as your wife, so you better make this right. So God was not having any of that half-truth business that Abraham was trying to get away with, okay? What that shows is simply a lack of faith in God, that God was going to protect Abraham for everything. So God had to teach Abraham that lesson. He had to teach Pharaoh that lesson. And what we find out here is that a half-truth is still a whole lie. Okay? That's the story. That's what the story of Abraham teaches us. But Abraham's not the only one in the Bible who told lies. Remember these ladies? Shiphrah and Puah. Way back at the beginning of this book of Exodus, we read the story of Shiphrah and Puah. They were Hebrew midwives. And the word came down from the Pharaoh, we need to exterminate all of the Hebrew babies, the, bit, the boy babies. So if it's a boy, you need to kill it. If it's a girl, you can let it live. But when you're delivering these babies, do not allow the boy babies to survive. Shifra and Pua, they said we cannot we cannot abide by that decision. Okay? Now this takes, uh, this takes a lot of, of uh, thinking out of the way for us this week, doesn't it? Because God says, life is a gift from me, and babies are a gift from me to you. And we want babies to live. This is God saying that, and that story they said, we're not going to listen to the king who said, kill the babies. We're going to, to let them live. And so they disobeyed the king. They saved the babies. But then they came up with a little lie about it. They said, we're going to say that they delivered the babies before we got there. And we couldn't help it. So they did tell lies. Well, the rest of the story is that God gave them their own families because he was so glad that they valued life and that they trusted in God instead of obeying the, the, the evil king and the evil commandment. However, they were not they were not applauded for telling the lie, but they were applauded for saving the babies. Okay, so what they did what they did got the blessing of God. And we will never really know what would have happened if they had just said no. If they had just said, uh, told the truth, we don't know what would have happened. We'll never get to know what would have happened. Okay? But that's something that did happen. And then there's, of course, Rahab. One of the most famous liars in the Bible Rahab is the one that harbored the spies that went into the land of Canaan. They were going into Jericho. Joshua decided, 
Uh, we'll send out a couple of folks to check out the country, check out the city, and then we'll bring in everybody. So we'll send an advance party. He sent two spies. I've always, I've always thought that was kind of, kind of cool because you remember who Joshua was? He was a spy himself 40 years before. When they sent 12 spies, the first time they went into the land, they sent 12 spies. And 10 of them came back and said, no, we better not go in because this, this country looks tough. These guys look tough and strong and, and, and mean and some of them are huge. So let's not go in. But two of them said, yes, let's go in, Joshua and Caleb. So two out of 10 voted yes. This is clearly a case where the majority is wrong. Okay, sometimes the majority is wrong. In this case, it was. So 40 years later, they're heading into the promised land. Joshua decides we're going to send some spies, but instead of sending 12, they just sent two. <laughs> that way, uh, they're not going to have a 10 to 2 vote anymore. Sends these two spies in, they go check out the land, and they're saved, they're harbored by Rahab. She hides them in her room and on the roof, and she says, we know that you're going to come in. We know that your God is going to give you this country. Everybody here is scared to death of you and your God. So we want you to protect me. Will you protect me and my family when you guys come in? Because we know you're going to come in and we know you're going to win. And God said, and the, the spy said, yes. So what we're going to do is you can identify your house with that red cord hanging out the window. We'll know which one is yours. We'll pass the word along that you guys are safe. When the officials came to her door, she said, no, I haven't seen them. No, they're not here. And that was a lie. We don't know what would have happened if she had told the truth, but she did the right thing. She may not have said the right thing, but she did the right thing. And she is rewarded for putting her trust in God, giving her faith in God, and harboring the spies that were working on God's side. She is rewarded in such a way that not only was she saved from when the, when the walls fell and when the, uh, when the Israelites came in and took over the city, not only was she and her family saved, but she married into the Israelites. Not only did she marry into the Israelites, she married a special one who was down the line an ancestor to David. Therefore, Rahab is in the line in the ancestry of Jesus. She is in the absolute royal family tree. And it's because she put her faith in God and trusted in God. Not because she lied, but because she did follow through with, with her faith in God. So these are some famous liars in the Bible. No, there's some other famous liars in the Bible. In 1 John, 1 John, it tells us a couple of ways that you might be a liar. He says, the people that say that they're Christians and yet they continue to walk in darkness, you're a liar and the truth is not in you. These are people that are posing as Christians. So he says, some of you guys, you say you're Christians, but you're continuing in, a, in an ungodly lifestyle. You're a liar, and the truth is not in you. Two verses later, he says another way. He says, some of you are Christians, and you're going around saying that you never get into any sins. That you know, you're just through sinning. You're, not, you're so holy now that you don't ever sin anymore. And he said, in this case, you're a liar. The truth is not in you. So these are two ways that people still, still get into, into lying. Well, let's think about some, some other aspects, some other applications of this going forward. Our speech should never be careless. Bible tells us in Matthew that right there in Matthew we're going to be held accountable 
for every idle word. Every idle word. Okay? That means the things that you say, you should say them on purpose. Okay? Stuff shouldn't just be slipping out. You should say them on purpose because you're going to be held accountable for every word. Okay? Our speech should also be simple and direct. You should be known as someone who never has to uh, add any emphasis to what you say. If you say yes, well, everybody knows he's a man of his word. He said yes, he means yes. He says no, he means no. Okay? That's what it says. You to make your yes be yes and your no be no. Simple, direct. You shouldn't have to give any complications on it than that. You shouldn't have to swear. You shouldn't have to, to, to do any kind of gestures. You say yes, you mean yes. Our speech should also be gracious. Okay. Here's a, and he throws in a cookie term here in Colossians. He said, your speech should be gracious, seasoned like salt. Like, make it tasty and delicious. So, everything you say ought to be gracious and edifying and building up. And of course, absolutely bottom line, the things that we say need to be loving. We need to absolutely speak the truth in love. Okay? And the most important thing about our speech has to do when we're speaking to God. Because this is an area that we may not always give complete honesty to. But when we're talking with God, when we're praying to God, when we are one-on-one -on -one with God, you've got to make sure that you are honest to God. This is what he told the woman at the well. He said, it doesn't matter where you, where you worship. You can worship here, you can worship there. Wherever you go to worship, the main thing is that God is the Spirit. And if you want to worship God, you must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And as long as you're praying to God and say, right, God, I'm okay, you're okay, but uh, um, help me out in this area. God, everything's going all right for me. God, you know, I really haven't been, been uh, falling into any sin. I don't really need any help with any of that. Then we're in trouble. Because we're not being honest with God. If we're being honest with God, our prayer is going to start, give me, give me what I'm not, what I don't have. Make me what I, what I am not. The things that I don't know, teach me. And the things that I've done, you've got to forgive me. Because I've done this, I blew it this week. I was trying to do all this stuff on my own and I blew it. And so Lord, I'm coming back asking for your grace, asking for your mercy. That's when we're honest with God. When we just lay all our cards on the table. And because actually He knows it all already. You're not going to hide anything from Him. You lay your cards on the table and say, Jesus, help me. I need you this hour. I need you in my life. And I need you to fix the wreck that I have made of myself. That needs to be our prayer. Going forth. Let's pray right now. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful to you for loving us, loving us anyway, and letting us come into, our, into your house, into your presence, to the throne of grace and worship. Help us, Lord, to make our speech, and above all, our speech toward you, be honest and sincere, straight from our heart, so the cards on the table, we need you in our life. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Um.